We're about to sack our producer and director and, and, and get, our late, our late producer. And, 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 and get a lunch lady to do it, quite frankly. But anyway, are you ready? Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, okay, let's go take two. It's going to take two of 600 probably at this rate, but let's right. go. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Ascari. I'm Mohammed. We're two of the surgeons here in the United Kingdom, and we wanted to start off our podcast by discussing the FRCS general surgical examination. We're hoping to make this a series of podcasts whereby we take you through not just the topics and not just the content, but also how you actually go about structuring your answers and getting the highest points and marks you can get. Yeah, so to start, I'm going to ask Mr. Ascari, what's the definition of blood? Yeah, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong question to start <laughs> off with. What we're going to start with is uh, what's important here is that as part of the FRCS podcast series that we're going to do, we will also talk about things like definitions and their importance and how important it is that you have a set and clear, concise definition of these things that you'll be asked, like what is shock, what is blood, and so on but also have an algorithm in your head as to how you're going to answer each question. So today, the topic we're going to start off with is OG cancer. So, Mr. Ali, you have a 63-year-old gentleman who is presented to your two-week weight clinic with dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, weight loss, and has had some nausea and vomiting as well. This is your upper GI station. Tell us how you'd approach this patient. So first, you'd like to tell the examiner that you're aware that cancer is the first priority in your uh, in your mind, and you need to go about investigating accordingly. So you'd take you'd like to not waste a lot of time saying you take a history and examination. So you do a focused history and examination, mainly looking for salient points that you'd like to um, highlight, meaning that you'd like to elicit where there's a short course of the symptoms, whether there's uh, associated weight loss, hemoptysis. Uh, any family history of note, any risk factors such as smoking or exposure to chemicals or anything like that. Uh, obesity is also a major risk factor for OG cancer as of late. Um, you then like to also elicit the findings that you'd like to look in the exam, such as palpable masses and um, subclavian um, sub lymph nodes, supraclavicular lymph nodes. Um, and then you'd like to immediately go on to management and also counselling the patient accordingly. So you'd like to get an urgency, uh, urgent OGD by to equate, to equate rule and you want to counsel the patient that this is what's going to happen. And then further work up the patient based on the results by getting further scans, barium swallows based on what you can find. Excellent. So very thorough answer. And just to recap, this is how you're going to answer it. This is a potentially worrying diagnosis, and I'm concerned that this patient may have cancer. So to this end, I'm going to do, and you have to use I and my a lot. Not, we could do, we could do this, or talk nebulously. You've got to talk I, and it's got to be concise, and it's got to be definitive. I would take a thorough history and examination. And what the, the, there's some phrases that you need to use during these uh, scenarios and using things like a, a concise or thorough history or s eliciting the salient points such as, and that's when you demonstrate what you think is the worrying symptoms, i.e. dysphagia, weight loss, and so <clears> on, <throat> depending on what the scenario is. Then you want to say that you would go through the medical history and take a drug history, a medical, past medical history, a drug history, and a social history, smoking, alcohol, uh, and uh, that, 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 that those are very real risk factors that we need to take into account. And then you wrap up what the findings are, if that's what the examiner wants you to do. And then you go on to say that my next steps would be to undertake some blood tests. Then the investigations are going to be definitive. And in this case, the definitive investigations are going to be... OGD. OGD, and if you're worried about cancer, which you are in this case, saying that you do a CT scan of the chest or abdomen and pelvis is, is, is not incorrect either. And then what the examiner will do is take you on to the next stage. We'll say, okay, you've examined the patient, you've taken the history, here are the results of the investigations, and they may show you a picture of OGD or a report or a histology from a biopsy, and we will take it from there. So Mr. Ali, the OGD that you requested has now come back as a adenocarcinoma of the gastroesophageal junction at 37 centimeters, and it's a moderately, moderately differentiated carcinoma. You have not undertaken a CT scan yet. You just have the OGD report, and you've seen the patient in your clinic two weeks, three weeks after your initial di your meeting. What do you do next? 
So I'd like to be sat in the appropriate setting for this meeting with the patient. I'd like to have the cancer nurse with me as well before breaking the news. I'd like to ask the patient to bring along a family member who they can support. Uh, they can rely on their support and bring the news to the patient. Then I'd like to get them a staging CT scan. I'd also like to, um, uh, based on it's an adenocarcinoma, want to assess whether they're able to swallow and maintain their weight with it or not. There may be a need for um, adjuncts for feeding, such as uh, depending on the practice of the unit that we have, whether they might need NJ feeding or dietary support to start with NJ feeding or maybe even a stent based on that. We'd then like to move on um, and say that you'd like to assess the patient in terms of physical fitness for surgery, um, quantify that in terms of performance status, as well as ASA based on what you're subjectively looking at. There are other also calculations that you can make based on their ability to sustain surgery and consider that as an option. We also need to warn the patient that before we move on, depending on the size of the patient, we'd like to take them to the MDT, where they're more likely to need to have neoadjuvant chemotherapy along the OEO2 and OEO5 trials, which is basically neoadjuvant uh, neo platinum-based therapy with an adjunct before having surgery. There may be also, based on the, the, the current practice of the unit, maybe an adjuvant radiotherapy component as well as per the cross-trial. Excellent. Okay, so just to summarize there, as Mr. Alex quite rightly said, what, we're going to, what you're going to answer is that you would first of all need to stage this patient. Before that, however, the approach that, that you need to take is a multidisciplinary team approach, and you need to say those words quite clearly because it shows a certain level of maturity in your answer and that you're thinking at a higher level. So, for example, getting the nurse, clinical nurse specialist, the cancer nurse specialist to accompany you in clinic is a very good thing to say. So you're going to break the bad, you're going to break the news to the patient with a family member if they have one with them, with a nurse specialist, and then you're going to outline what the next steps are. The next steps are is that this patient is going to get going to go to an MDT meeting discussion, and that's going to involve almost certainly a CT scan if it's not already been done so, and possibly other adjuncts, which may be an endoscopic ultrasound or a CT PET if there's any uh, ambiguity as to whether there is, a, there, there is extra GI disease, such as lymph nodes, for example. Once you have got that, then you can then talk about the treatment options available based on the staging and based on the MDT. The examiner may stop you there and just delve deeper into the investigations, or they may allow you to move on and go into the treatment. The treatment options are essentially, you need to have them in clear boxes. So for example, there's conservative management, there is endoscopic management, the surgical management, or essentially a combination of, of these. And feeding adjuncts is particularly important. What's key in getting higher marks here is that you are aware of the current guidelines, and you, you'll, you'll see in our link down below uh, that there is a nice guidelines that we go by, and you can't even drop that in your answer. I would approach this patient's workup and management as per the current nice guidelines, which include this, this, and that. And Ultimately, depending on the tumor stage, you would undertake either conservative management or palliative chemotherapy if the patient has got very advanced disease or is otherwise medically unfit for a procedure, which will come out of the MDT meeting, or you would undertake a surgical resection. Uh, Mr. Ali, let's say that the patient has got a T2N1M0 tumor at 38 centimeters, and the patient presumably is fit as per the CPET, and that's an important thing to also consider that most patients in the UK uh, would go for CPET uh, testing to make sure they are physiologically fit to actually undergo the surgery. And there is an, there'll be another link below this YouTube channel that you'll see the link to it. The patient has got an anabolic threshold of 17, which is pretty good. Anything below 10 is a bad sign that they're going to do badly after surgery, and most units would probably refuse a patient on that basis, even if the tumor is resectable. Let's say the patient is in relatively good physiological shape. The tumor is resectable at T2N1, M0. What is your... And they've had the new adjuvant chemotherapy, which is currently FLOT. And again, you can see the guidelines down below. The patient comes back and has what before you go on to surgery? So he has a staging laparoscopy to ensure that there's exactly. no disease progression so in the peritoneal cavity. Perfect. So you restage the patient. That in, in the UK, that currently involves, for gastroesophageal tumors in most units, would involve a repeat CT scan and a 
uh, laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy, to make sure there is no disseminated disease in the peritoneum that has not been picked up by the CT scan. Okay, so the peritoneum is clear, the laparoscopic diagnos the laparosco diagnostic laparoscopy is all clear, the staging laparoscopy, and your CT scan is still T2 and 0 now, let's say. What is your surgical approach? Yeah. So, uh, based on my recent... Training. We're going to stop saying so at the beginning of every sentence in the future, but for the time being, we'll carry on saying... I've counseled the patient for a minimum invasive esophagectomy. <laughs> Wrong answer. Um, <laughs> you're going to say what 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 you've practiced in your unit. In most units in the United Kingdom, uh, they're not as skilled as Mr. Ali. I've not seen an open. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've not seen an open esophagectomy. I'm so good. I've not seen an open operation. Um, we're going to do a robotic esophagectomy just because we can't. We're not. We're not. The exam answer is this: in most units, and say what you do in your unit. But most units, it's a hybrid procedure which means you're going to do a laparoscopic approach to mobilize the stomach, form the conduit, do your lymphadenectomy, and we'll talk a little bit about what the lymph node stations are. Vince Starskar and I have worked in the, both in the same unit that does MIOs, so yeah, let's go. I'll, I'll we're, we're not going to say that. The, the exam answer is that we are going to do a hybrid procedure. So we're going to do mobilize the stomach, lymphadenectomy, form the conduit, and then we're going to do a pull through the chest and we're going to do an open thoracotomy, typically at the sixth or fifth inter intercostal space, depending on how high the tumor is. And then we can go and talk about that. Thing. Right. What would you counsel the patient for, Mr. Skye? Excellent question. So ultimately, this is a very highly morbid, highly associated with high mortality. Uh, it's a very major operation where the patient requires a certain level of fitness and post-operative care. So the, on the consent form, this is what we're going to say. As, per, as for any operation that we do, anesthetic, infection, bleeding, and pain are going to be uh, universally across all surgical procedures. Specific to, to a gastroesophageal resection, uh, or either Lewis, as we're describing now, is going to be anastomotic leak, which unfortunately happens uh, quite uh, frequently, um, according to some other anastomoses, uh, compared to some other anastomoses. We're going to counsel them for chyle leak, organ damage, or visceral, uh, visceral or vascular damage. We're going to also tell them about the need for reoperation, and we're also going to tell them that even though we've done a stage in laparoscopy, it may be inoperable. Pulmonary embolism, DVT, cardiorespiratory complications, including MI, are not uh, uncommon, and the patient should be counseled for these as well. So you've done your minimum invasive was project to me and the patient this is not bad for uh, off the cuff <laughs> <laughs> and your patient develops day five temp uh, he's on itu uh, he's about to be stepped down and he starts having a temperature of 38 he's uh, got atrial fibrillation he's got heart rate of 130 and his stock dropped down to 90. what's going on so this is a potential scenario that is not too uncommon and also not too uncommon in the exam and Ultimately, what you're really concerned about here, the parameters that we've described, is somebody who's likely had an anastomotic leak or has got a major source of sepsis if it's not an anastomotic leak. So that'll be the, the first thing you want to say is my differential di This is a very worrying scenario. My differential diagnosis is that there is an anastomotic dehiscence or anastomotic leak. The way to approach it again is to go back to the initial period, uh, to the initial baseline. Uh, treatment algorithms that we do for CRISP or sepsis 6 and you need to specifically mention these. What they don't want you to do is tell them that you're going to be putting in cannulas and the nitty-gritty kind of more detailed stuff. What you want is to have a statement or a sentence that will outline all of that. I would assess and simultaneously resuscitate the patient as per the CRISP and sepsis 6 protocol which would involve thorough history, examination, review of charts, antibiotics, fluids, oxygen, lactate, and so on. And that demonstrates not only do you recognize the seriousness of the operation, but all of the uh, situation, but also demonstrates that you are aware of what CRISP and sepsis 6 uh, involves without spending an untoward amount of time on it and the bell goes. So Ultimately, what you want, you want to do, investigate the patient further by undertaking a CT with oral and IV contrast. And it's important that we give oral contrast because if there is an anastomotic dehiscence, we want to see where. Okay. So your consultant and uh, intensive care physician colleague um, saying he's too unstable to move to get to a CT scan. What other adjuncts can you use on the intensive care unit? 
very good question. So the patient is very unstable, and you, you're not confident that you can take him to imaging to have him to take him to an imaging modality. What you could undertake is two things really. One is a portable chest X-ray that you would want, and the second is a by the bedside scope that we'd like to have, which is an OGD. Right, lovely. So you do that, and the OGD. So. so. The OGD reveals the English is very bad. The English. There's a. So the OGD does 50% dehiscence in the circumference of your anastomosis. What's your next step? Okay, so we've confirmed our diagnosis. There is a dehiscence, very serious situation. Patient is septic and unstable. In this scenario, if the patient is unstable, you'd be obliged to take the patient back to, to theater to do a washout. And to then, you need, that would take care of the chest, chest sepsis part of it. So that's one thing. The second thing is you've got to deal with the anastomotic dehiscence. Now, Given there were five days down the line, it's going to be difficult to repair this. However, you've got two options. One is to repair, to take down the anastomosis and redo it. The second option would be to use an endoscopic therapy, which is endospot or endovac. With a 50% de anastomotic dehiscence, that's quite large and maybe difficult to do. The final and safest one, which most surgeons do not want to do unless we have to, and this may be one of these scenarios, is an esophagostomy which would bring a bit of the esophagus out as a mucus fistula, as a spit fistula, and reconstruct at a later date. Now, depending on the scenario, you need to pick one of those, and the examiner may then fleet from one or to the other when, to, to try and test your knowledge, not because you've got the right answer, the wrong, wrong answer, but because they just want to see how flexible you are in your response. So be prepared to switch from one to the other, depending on the uh, scenario. No, Mr. Ascari, you graduated at the time when the Backstreet Boys were still together, but pretend you're a day one consultant. Would you go to theatre alone? Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a very good point. Uh, so not only do you have to demonstrate that you are going to do what needs to be done to get this patient out of the septic episode and to stabilize them, but you also have to have demonstrate that you've got an awareness of your own clinical abilities and limitations and also make it clear that you're going to be working in a multidisciplinary team approach. And this is where you're going to have another colleague, more senior uh, consultant colleague, upper GI OG cancer trained, that's going to take the patient back with you. You're also going to need other staff that are not surgeons, such as the anesthetic team, the intensive care team, and the uh, theater team, as well as the um, supportive team afterwards, such as dietitians, physios, um, radiologists potentially. Very good.